On one occasion during their travels, Jesus said to his disciples, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now the disciples reasoned among themselves and they said, It is because we have taken no bread. And he thought he, they thought he was dropping a little hint there when he said, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees that the, the, the fact that they didn't bring bread with them, I think they might have had a loaf. I think one of the other accounts mentions they had a little bit of bread, but they didn't bring enough is the point. And he, they thought that he was pointing that out to them. But let's take up the account in Matthew chapter 16 and beginning in verse 8 and see what, how he responds to that. But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, O oh, you of little faith, why do you reason among yourselves because you have brought no bread? Do you not yet understand or remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets you took up? Remember how Jesus had fed 5,000 with only five loaves? And then after the feeding had taken place, after, after everybody had gotten the, whatever they wanted, then they took up all these baskets? You know, of course, obviously we're talking about a miracle there. Nor the seven loaves or the, of the 4,000 and how many large baskets you took up. And this is something that just happened a short time before then. Seven loaves, only seven loaves, and he fed 4,000 with them and then took up several large baskets full afterward. Again, another miracle. He says, how is it that you do not understand that I do not speak to you concerning bread? In other, in other words, uh, if I may use the, uh, if I may retranslate that, use the, uh, a revised version of it, he's saying, look, you don't get it yet, do you? You don't get it. How, when will you understand that finding enough bread to eat is not an issue? You know, they, he knew he could provide the bread if they needed bread. He goes on to say, but to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees, then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So what is it about the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees that they needed to beware of? What was this leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? You know, there were several differences between the sects, those two religious sects, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Uh, the Sadducees had their stronghold in the temple and in the priesthood, and some would argue that they were, by that time, that they had become more of a political party than a religious one. And, uh, the Pharisee, and also they believed, they, they did believe, well, I'll put it this way, they were biblical literalists. A lot of people think, well, the, uh, the, the Pharisees were very conservative and the, the Sadducees were very liberal. But actually, the Sadducees were biblical literalists and tended to be somewhat fundamentalist in their approach to scriptures and they believed that the written Torah was authoritative while the Pharisees taught that adherence to the twofold Torah which consisted of both the written law and the law allegedly handed down from Moses through Joshua through the elders of Israel finally uh, to the Pharisees themselves and they were considered to be the experts in the law in the time of Jesus the Pharisees had uh, had gained that reputation for themselves. They were the experts on the law and the preservers and keepers of divine revelation. The Sadducees were, as I said, biblical fundamentalists, if you understand what I mean by that term. They claimed the Torah taught nothing about the resurrection from the dead and or about eternal life, so they did not believe in those things. Uh, for example, you go back and read through the Torah, read what the promises were to Abraham, and indeed God says, I will, you will inherit this land. He says, your descendants after you will inherit the land. He even goes on to tell them, you will die in a good old age. He does not say, I'm going to resurrect you and then give you the land as a possession forever. You get the impression, well, that uh, this, will be carried, this, this possession of the land, the promise of possession will be carried out through his descendants. And that's the way the Sadducees approached the scriptures because there was no specific reference to Abraham being resurrected or having eternal life. That's the approach they took. The, Sa the Pharisees, on the other hand, did believe in the resurrection and eternal life. And as we can see in the scriptures, if you want to say who did Jesus side with, 
on that particular issue, then obviously he sided with the Pharisees, as, as did the Apostle Paul and, in fact, the whole apostolic church. But they taught, the Pharisees taught, that those who faithfully kept all the precepts of the twofold Torah, that's the written law as well as the oral tradition or the tradition of the elders as it's called in the New Testament, that they would be rewarded with eternal life. And the general population of the Jews in the time of Jesus sided with the Pharisees on that particular point. Turn with me to chapter 22 of the book of Matthew. Let's see how Jesus dealt with the Sadducees on a certain question uh, concerning uh, the resurrection. And obviously they were, again, the, being the biblical literalists that they were and not seeing anything implicit in a text and tending to see only things that were explicitly revealed. Uh, this is the question they posed to Jesus. Verse 23, Matthew 22, verse 23. The same day the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him and asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses says that if a man dies, having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were, there were with us seven brothers. The first died after he had married, and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third, even to the seventh. I tell you what, if I'd have been one of those brothers down the line someplace, about fourth or fifth, I'd have been thinking a little bit, what, what's going on here? <laughs> so down to the seventh. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had her. Oh, they got him there, didn't they? They thought. Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. So they didn't know the power of God, but they, he says, interestingly, they didn't know the scriptures either. Jesus understood that this hyper-literalistic type of interpretation didn't work, that there was more implicit in, a t in this many of the texts in the Old Testament, including the Torah, than the Sadducees were willing to acknowledge. He says, for in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels. Doesn't say they are angels, but are like angels, uh, the angels of God in heaven. But concerning the resurrection of the dead, now is Jesus going to find a reference in Scripture uh, to the resurrection of the dead? Specifically in the Torah. Remember the Sadducees, it has been said that they didn't believe in the, uh, anything but the Pentateuch. I don't think that's accurate. I think that's because someone confused the Sadducees uh, with uh, uh, the Samaritans who did believe only in the Pentateuch. But they did give the Torah, the, the Pentateuch, the, the highest authority. They recognized it as the highest authority. So will, be, will Jesus be able to find some kind of reference, whether explicit or implicit, in the Torah? It says, but concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God saying, I am the God of Abraham. Notice he didn't say, I was the God of Abraham. Now he's quoting right out of Exodus chapter 3 and verse 6. God said this to Moses, which means that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had long since been dead by the time God said this. He didn't say, I was the God of Abraham, and I was the God of Isaac as well as Jacob. But now I am such and such. No, no, he says, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now Jesus adds this. He says, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. What does that imply? What does it mean? It means that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, if he is their God, then they must yet live. Even though they've died, they will live. So there he found a reference, although implicit, a reference to the resurrection in the Pentateuch. And when the multitudes heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. Now, I, as best I can tell from the sources <clears throat> that we have, this kind of teaching like this was in line with the way the Pharisees taught. Jesus was much closer to the way the Pharisees taught the scriptures than he was the way the Sadducees taught. Obviously, the Sadducees didn't have a comeback because they could see that the multitudes who were there with them were astonished. What are you going to say when everybody else says, wow, that's, that's great. You're going to come back and say, oh, no, that's not a very good explanation. No, you usually just walk away. That's what I always do. <laughs> I'd like to read something from the Encyclopedia of Religion about the Pharisees. And this is a, 
from page 270, just a few paragraphs here concerning the Pharisees. <clears throat> this comes, <clears throat> excuse me, this comes from the uh, section entitled Essential Teachings and Institutions. It says, the essential core of Pharisaism was its affirmation of a triad of faith that sharply distinguished it from the priestly system of Judaism that had flourished uncontested from the time of the promulgation of the Pentateuch circa 397 BCE, it stands for before common era, or BC is the way we would usually say it, until the rise of the Pharisees, probably during the Hasmonean Re Revolt, which was 166 to 142 BC. This triad of faith proclaimed that one, now here's the triad, number one, the one God and Father so loved the individual that, number two, he revealed to his people Israel a twofold law, one written down in the five books of Moses, the Pentateuch, and the other transmitted orally from Moses to Joshua, to the elders, to the prophets, to the Pharisees, of course. And that number three, here's the third part of the triad, each individual who internalized this twofold law could look forward to eternal life for his soul and resurrection for his body. It would seem that the highly novel triad of faith was rejected by the Sadducees, no seem about it, they did, they did reject it, who reasserted the Aaronic or priestly belief that God had revealed a single immutable written law which made no mention of eternal life for the individual. On the basis of this triad of faith, however, the Pharisees asserted their authority over the Aaronic priesthood. And as I said before, the general populace at that time, the people, the, the Jews in general, both uh, in the diaspora as well as those in Jerusalem, uh, agreed with the Pharisees on these things. You know, it's interesting also that the Pharisees understood God as the Father, as a Father, not just merely a Father to the nation in a kind of a figurative sense, but in a more personal sense. This goes on to say, in addition to novel institutions, the Pharisees developed new notions about God and the peoplehood of Israel. Although God was occasionally conceived of in Scripture as a father, it was as the father of his people and not as the father of the individual. The Pharisees, on their part, however, spoke of the Father in heaven who so loves and cares for each individual that he revealed the road by which the individual could reach eternal life and resurrection. Now that reminds me of John 3.16. Only it's not through the Torah, the twofold Torah, twofold law, that uh, salvation is gained, but it is through God's Son, Jesus Christ, whom he sent. For the, but the Pharisees use similar language. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. In this case, he gave the twofold Torah. This goes on to say, the Pharisees stressed that God had chosen Abraham to father a people to be a blessing for all the peoples of the earth and not just for the seed of Abraham. The Pharisees therefore preached that membership in Israel was open to everyone who embraced the triad of faith. What defined a true Israelite was his belief that God had revealed a twofold Torah and that God would reward with eternal life and resurrection the law-abiding individual and punish with eternal suffering those who did not live in accordance uh, with its precepts. As far as eternal suffering, I think the Pharisees had difference of, differences of opinion on uh, the fate of the wicked. Some believed that they suffered for a period of time and then were finally uh, annihilated, I think. But in any case, you, you get the point here. He says, a pagan who asserted or who ascribed to these beliefs was thus a truer member of the house of Israel than was a Sadducee who, although born into Israel, rejected the twofold law and otherworldly rewards and punishments. So that's interesting, isn't it? You can see how there's certain parallels between Pharisaic thought and the epistles of Paul and the teachings of Jesus. I mean, they believed in a resurrection. They believed in eternal life, that this was a re the reward of those who were friends of God. And they also believed uh, in, uh, in God as a father who loves individuals, not just uh, the God of a nation, and just uh, sent a put a nation down here to obey him. And if they kept his laws, then they would have great blessings, and each generation would die off and never any hope to be raised from the dead or anything like that, as the Sadducees believed. But no, the Pharisees had something that was much closer to what we see in Christianity, in New Testament Christianity, and in the teachings of Jesus itself, himself.
So when you think about it, though, the twofold law is to some extent, don't get me wrong here, I don't believe in the tradition of the elders, I'm not going to start teaching that, but the, two, the concept of the twofold law is to some extent logical. You can see how it developed over time. For example, where in scripture do you find the rules for the calendar? I don't want to open up that can of worms. <laughs> but where do you find the rules? You don't. You find references to certain things related to the calendar, but where do you find a chapter that spells out the rules of the calendar? Where do you find instructions on postponements, on intercalary years, 19-year time cycles, phases of the moon, and so on? You don't find it, do you? You just don't find it. But again, let's, let's reclose that can of worms. <laughs> I think more importantly, you, might, you re have to realize along the way that you, have, you, you must realize that the people of Israel, as they move through time, Obviously, they encountered new situations along the way. And what we see there is actually the same thing that happened within Christianity. If you look at the history of Roman Catholicism and of Eastern Orthodoxy, they emphasize the capital T tradition, both, both churches. They teach that God's word is contained in capital T traditions, not the lowercase t traditions, plural, but the capital T tradition, which includes, includes but is not restricted to the Bible. The Pharisees had something like that in their belief. Uh, you can understand how that as new situations came along, naturally questions would come up regarding the application of law. Now what happens when questions concerning the application of law in a new situation take place? Well normally, you know, God, what God had done, he put in, system, in place a system of judges. And when a, a situation arose, and a judgment was made, then in, oftentimes that judgment became a law. It became part of the law. Uh, because now they know. Now, in other words, now we know what to do in these situations and how that particular law or this particular law applies. So what happens, though, when you have this system going on and over time you realize that you're under the dominance of foreign powers, a foreign government such as the Romans, and that, you know, your, your system of judges, that doesn't work anymore. Also, when you look around and you see a priesthood that is almost totally corrupt and in collusion with the dominant governments, then what do you do in resolving questions that naturally come up? And, you know, Israel, from the time they returned from the captivity in Babylon, uh, were in, under, those, under those conditions to large measure. So what do you do? What do you do? Well, you have to have somebody stand up, somebody uh, come to the forefront and begin uh, trying to help out. Well, guess who filled in, in the gap? Well, it was this group that would come to be known as the Pharisees. The Pharisees. They opposed, they strongly opposed the Hellenization of the Jews and sought to preserve the ways of the Hebrew fathers. This was a group of Torah observant men who would come to be known, as I said, as the party of the Pharisees. So I can see how good intentions may have been involved in the Pharisees' battle to preserve the traditions that they had received and consider those traditions a matter of law. I understand how that could happen. That would include ritual purity customs such as washing of the hands after eating, or I'm, I'm sorry, before eating, and many other things. Those were, and, and many of those, you know, were not necessarily bad customs. In fact, I recommend washing your hands before eating. That's a good idea. I'm not going to condemn you if you don't. Just keep your hands away from my plate. But <laughs> no, I'll, no, it's it's a good a good thing. But to put give that a higher status of law, something similar to the law God gave to Israel. That's you're get beginning to move into an area that's uh, well. I think all of us here would be very uncomfortable with. But that's what the Pharisees ultimately did. The problem was that these laws or these uh, traditions were sometimes applied in such a way that much more important laws were either set aside or ignored. Remember when Jesus was commenting on the Corban tradition. He says, by your tradition, you set aside the commandment of God. They, they had, they, the, something had led them to reverse the order of things, to get their priorities all out of kilter. They didn't. They, they were placing insignificant or relatively insignificant laws higher than more important spiritual laws, and we'll talk about in a few moments 
how it was that that came to be. Well, the Pharisees became the dominant religious authority in the Jewish world. They certainly outranked the Sadducees in popularity with the people. They established synagogues in virtually every city and promoted prayers and readings of the Law and the Prophets. We have them to credit for that. You know, they wanted to see to it that the Jews in the Diaspora had access to the Law and to the Prophets, and so they promoted the synagogue, and they saw to it that people could hear the reading of the Law and the Prophets every Sabbath and that they would have prayers and people could get together for worship. That way they could preserve uh, the, all things Hebrew. They wanted to oppose any, any foreign elements that might come creeping in, especially uh, Hellenistic, the attractions of the Hellenistic world. They wanted to oppose all of that. It might be said, that though, that in their promotion of the synagogue, in the promotion of the Law and the Prophets throughout the known world at the time, it might be said that they were that they were actually inadvertently preparing the way for the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the growth of the New Testament church. For in creating the synagogues in various places, they were actually creating a point whereby the apostles could go out and proclaim the gospel to a people who already had the law and the prophets and now needed to understand how the law and the prophets pointed directly to Jesus Christ and to the coming kingdom of God. So they inadvertently were preparing the way for the spread of the gospel and the growth of the New Testament church. I'm sure after they thought about that for a while, they weren't very happy with, what, <laughs> with the outcome. Well, you know, it can be said also that in fact, the man that would end up writing more New Testament epistles than any of the 12 apostles or their associates was himself a Pharisee. Look at Acts chapter 23. Here we'll break into the account where Paul is being accused before uh, a crowd. Verse 6, but when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, men and brethren. What did he say? Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee. He knew what he was doing here because he knew about the contention between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But nevertheless, he did not hesitate to let people know he was a Pharisee. That was the party he belonged to. That was the party he, brought, he was brought along in that taught him, that trained him. He says, men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, a Pharisee of Pharisees, in other words. Concerning the hope and the resurrection of the dead, I am being judged. See, they believed in that. The Sadducees who were there also didn't believe it. So what is Paul doing? He's turning the attention away from himself. And when, when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For Sadducees say there is no resurrection and no angel or spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. Then there arose a loud outcry, and the scribes of the Pharisees' party arose and protested, saying, We find no evil in this man. Hey, he's one of us. We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. Now they're being logical. <laughs> he goes on to say now, the, the text goes on to say now, when there arose a great dissension, the commander, fearing lest Paul might be pulled to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them, and bring him into the barracks. So Paul kind of created himself a way of escape by turning them on each other because he was certainly well aware of the differences between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And obviously he agreed with the, Sad uh, with the Pharisees on this matter of resurrection and eternal life. So what was the leaven of the Pharisees? Well, it was reflected in their doctrine or their teaching particularly in their application of the traditions of the elders, they substituted, they actually substituted human traditions for God's laws, unnecessarily binding the consciences of men with a burdensome yoke. That's what it really came down to. But why did they do this? Where did this come from? What led them to, to behave this way and to take that approach? Well, what was at the heart of their misguided interpretations? And the answer is very simply 
self-exalting pride. That's it. Once self-exalting pride enters in, then it's going to distort everything else in your life to some extent or another. Your priorities will become wrong. Your approach to life will become wrong. Your approach to relationships will no longer be what they should be. Self-exalting pride is, in fact, destructive pride. And that's what happened to the Pharisees. They had become the religious authorities of the day. Now, I personally believe that when the, the movement began, the, those who were eventually would be called Pharisees, that they, they had good intentions. I know, you know what they say about good intentions. But uh, they had good intentions. I do think they cared about their people. They cared about uh, preserving Jewish law and Jewish customs and the temple, and they wanted things to be like it was during the Solomonic kingdom days. They wanted a restoration of the kingdom. They wanted God to restore to the Jews the kingdom to Israel. That's what they looked for. That's what they sought. That was a goal. So I believe that that's, that's what they had in mind at first. But when they, once they became the religious authorities of the day, having exceeded the temple cult in popularity, and the people in general following their lead, seeing them as successors of Moses and as experts of divine law, well, things began to change. They had made a name for themselves, but they had become hypocritical. Pride had entered in. They became hypocritical, seeking human approval more than God's approval. And you see in the many woes aimed at them in Matthew chapter 23 that this was precisely the case. They had changed, largely because of the popularity that they had gained. And now they were preeminent, they were prominent in the religious world of that time among the Jews and were prayed, received many praises of men, and eventually they let this get to them and they were filled with pride. Look at Matthew chapter 23. We're not going to read the whole thing, but I'm going to read a portion of it. And you see this coming across very plainly. This was the problem. And keeping in mind, though, that the way the New Testament is written, uh, we can't read this and conclude that all the Pharisees were the way Jesus describes these Pharisees. There were actually Pharisees who were sympathizers with Jesus. They believed he was the Messiah. And no doubt, I don't know how many, but Pharisees, some Pharisees, were converted once the Holy Spirit was given on the day of Pentecost. We also know that later on or during that period, it says a large company of priests believed. That means that probably some people from the, among the Sadducees came into the truth and became partakers of the Holy Spirit. So you can't label all fair, you can't paint everything with a broad brush, but you have, you do get the impression that by this time, the vast majority of the Pharisees had corrupted themselves through this destructive pride. Chapter 23, beginning in verse 1, Then Jesus said to the crowds and to the disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in, on Moses' seat, so practice and observe whatever they tell you, but do not do what they do. Now some people look at that and say, whatever they tell you? Well, didn't he just uh, not too many verses earlier tell them not to do according to their traditions? Yeah, well, so what does he mean here? Well, obviously, it doesn't mean every single thing that they tell you to do, but if it was consistent with what Moses taught, and they did teach a lot of truth, then you do those things. And this Moses seat was not a, a position that, that we could conclude that God gave to them. It's a position that they gave themselves. So they, sat, they had sat themselves. They had ensconced themselves in the seat of Moses. He says, and here's the point. He says, practice and observe whatever they tell you. Of course, if it's in line with what Moses taught. But here's the main point. But do not what they do. Why? They were hypocrites. Where does hypocrisy emerge from? From that same pride. That same captivating, uh, self-exalting pride that drives a person to these types of behaviors. For they preach and do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by others. There's the key right there. Everything they do, they do it to be seen by others. They've gotten used to it. They like the praise. They like for people to tell them how great they were. 
and this was a problem. They were no longer doing this for God in his service to preserve the things of God, but now they were doing it so that they could be seen by others and receive the praise of others. For they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long, and they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi. You hear that, don't you, Dave? <laughs> You're not to be called rabbi. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is this is talking. This is not saying he's not saying here that uh, the title rabbi itself is any. There's anything wrong with that. Uh, what he's talking about is a frame of mind. They loved being called rabbi because this was a in their minds was a, a way of honoring them. <clears throat> but you for you have one teacher. That's what rabbi means, and you are all brothers. And call no man your father on earth. Doesn't mean that you can't call your dad father. Doesn't mean you don't have spiritual fathers. Paul says he was a father to the Corinthians. He says, by the gospel, I have begotten you. So he was a father in that sense to them. But this is talking about an attitude. They wanted to place themselves alongside the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to be considered the fathers of the nation of Israel, the fathers of the faith, and so on, because of this self motivating this self-exalting uh, pride. Neither be, be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ. Now here's the key. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. It's a universal truism. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. That means he's going to be brought down one way or the other. But whoever humbles himself, well, he'll be exalted. But you know, if you're humbling yourself and you experience exaltation, it's not, it's not an exaltation that is based on pride, is it? No, it's what God gives to you. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you shut up the kingdom of God in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter in to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Notice he says hypocrites over and over again. For you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte. You know, that's what we were talking about earlier. They did believe that Gentiles could become a part of the nation of Israel if they adhered to the twofold Torah and did all the things, of course, they told them to do. But it says you, you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte and when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. You ever notice how that works? If you take a young, impressionable mind and you begin to teach that person, if you teach him the good things, then he, he grows accordingly. But if you instill in him evil things, the pride that you or yourself or the, the, the teacher himself uh, has, then he becomes even worse than the teacher at the end of the day. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, If anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. You see how they got their priorities wrong and had to have everything in reverse here? You blind fool. Where do you think that custom grew from? Where did it come from? Well, obviously, you had questions concerning oaths the oath laws in the Old Testament. And when people came up against a situation where they were under an oath and yet it seemed impossible to keep the oath at the time, then there became, a, the, you know, the judges had to deal, someone had to deal with that and come up with an answer. And out of all of that, out of, out of the questions, grew this, uh, this gradation of oath. Well, this oath is more binding than that oath. Uh, if, you, you know, if you swear by the temple, well, that's a binding oath, but not as binding if you swear by the gold in the temple. And so the, the Pharisees themselves had come up with these sorts of things. You blind fools, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that has made the gold sacred? And you say, if anyone swears by the altar, it is nothing. But if, some, if, some, if anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is bound by his oath. You blind men, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? You know, this is just common sense, really, isn't it? Just logical common sense. And yet they had missed it because of their self-exalting pride. 
So whoever swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it, and whoever swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it, and whoever swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. In other words, if you make an oath, if you swear, then you are bound to it because God is the one who ultimately uh, you're, you're accountable to. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others, without neglecting the minute. Now, to be honest, I do not think, I'll put it this way, I think that the Pharisees, by tithing on mint and, and dill and cumin, those were herbs that are used to flavor foods, I think they were going beyond, this is my opinion, they're going beyond what the Torah actually requires. Because the Torah tithing laws are concerned with harvest, with crops and so on, with produce, of course, increase of livestock and that sort of thing. But uh, he says, but don't leave, but, but he still approves, Jesus approves of their tithing on these, these small things, these, these herbs. He said, but he says, these you ought to have done. You, you should have emphasized the justice, the mercy, mercy, the faithfulness. Those are the things that the law underscore. You know, you read through the law and those things stand out everywhere. Uh, justice, mercy, faithfulness, you see it everywhere. Call for faithfulness. It says, these you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. But I, it's my understanding that they actually did in those days because they lived in a part of the world, most of them did, <clears throat> where gnats were very, very common. They're all over the place. Uh, just, you know, it's kind of like when you cut an, a cantaloupe and let it sit out for a while, you know, that kind of draws them there. Uh, but there were, were plenty of gnats and that they actually would use the strainer and pour their wine through the strainer to strain out the gnats. Why do you want to do that? Well, you don't want to swallow gnats. But uh, more than that, it's because they're unclean creatures. You got to get rid of those. They're unclean. So this is funny when he says you strain, strain at a gnat and then turn right around and swallow a camel, which is another unclean creature. So you, you see, you get, you get the point here, don't you? And then he says in verse 25, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they're full of greed and of self-indulgence. You blind Pharisees, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside also may be clean. You know, it's looked good on the outside, got all the form in, in place, got all the outside thing. We look good, but inside what are we? Uh, what were the Pharisees? This, this was... You, you get the drift here. You get the point. I'm not going to go on and read further, but uh, he goes on, does go on and condemn this kind of behavior, obviously. So we see why Jesus warned about the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. A great many within both parties had become prideful, uh, self-serving, greedy, and self-indulgent. Their doctrinal corruption stemmed from their internal corruption. We see the doctrinal corruption, the way they applied the traditions that had been handed down to them and probably created some of their own, their doctrinal corruption, their application of doctrine, of teaching, uh, stemmed from their internal corruption. Now, the analogy is both interesting and revealing. The analogy, analogy that Jesus uses, uh, he used in the beginning of this sermon when we began with uh, Matthew 16, and he says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It's an interesting as well as a revealing analogy. You know, if you add only a small amount of yeast to a lump of dough, the entire lump is affected, isn't it? Just one little small amount of yeast. You, know, you, you knead it, you work it in there. Uh, the only, the few times I've done that, you know, uh, when I've made a, a, a lump out of, made a lump of dough, and put, put a little yeast in it, and it didn't take much. It didn't, you know, the recipe didn't call for much. You, you know, you work it in there, and then uh, you apply heat just for a little while, and the things it doesn't take long. Next thing you know, the entire lump is affected, and it starts to swell and swell. And you put it in the oven, and you really get something different from what went into the oven. So, uh, you see the analogy. What a good analogy that is. It means a little bit of false doctrine or false practice stemming from sinful pride and self-indulgence can quickly permeate an entire church and corrupt its holiness. 
an entire congregation. You see this happening, or Paul warning about it in 1 Corinthians 5. We'll close with that scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the situation that occurred in the, had occurred in the Corinthian church. Paul says <clears throat> some things, you know, he commends this church on and other, other things he warns them about. And this is a very stern warning here. He says, it is actually reported, verse 1, that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. See, they, were, they, they probably saw themselves as tolerant. But Paul says, you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him, him who has done this be removed from among you. Now drop on down to verse 6. He says, your boasting is not good. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. What this means is, look, you've been declared righteous before God. Now then live like it. You weren't declared righteous so that you could now live unrighteously. You were, you were declared righteous on the basis of faith so that you could now live accordingly. Let us therefore celebrate the festival not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So what he's talking about here is not just the one time a year when we celebrate the festival. He's talking about a perpetual feast, as it were. This is something the festival reminds us to do daily and throughout the year. That is, we put out the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, and we, and we observe the feast. That is to say, we live our lives with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. You know, that's one of the major lessons of these days, I believe, for us. And certainly we should always keep in mind, not just during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, but also throughout the year.